This is Secrets of William Marshall's Portrait of Shakespeare. Here is the title page to the collected poems written by Will Shakespeare Gent, printed in London by Thomas Coates and sold by John Benson, published in 1640. Here's the frontispiece, which includes a very interesting poem at the bottom. But today we're going to concentrate on the engraving itself. If you think it looks familiar, well, you're not mistaken. It's based on the infamous portrait made by Martin Dross out the Younger for the 1623 first folio. You can see it better if we flip the dross out to match the marshal. As you can see, Marshall has added much more detail to the engraving. He has given him a cloak, he's holding a sprig of leaves, and you can see his, most of his left arm and a gloved hand. He is also in a frame which is more typical of portraits of writers of the period. The face is almost identical which tells me that Marshall used a camera obscura to create this portrait. We're going to fade the Dross out portrait bit by bit to show you exactly how they match. Here it is at around 70, five percent transparent. We make it more transparent. More transparent. More transparent still. It's almost completely transparent and you can see that the eyes, nose and mouth and even the forehead haven't changed at all. Though the hair is slightly different and the collars are obviously different. You can see it was a pretty much a seamless transition from the dross out to the marshal which is proof that he did use a camera obscura, but he made some significant changes that only become apparent when we do a few little experiments. We'll begin by splitting the portrait. I'm going to present to you what I call the portrait line. That's right here at the center of the collar. As you can see, it's completely geometric, perfectly formed 90 degree angles. That suggested to me that we are to treat this as a way of dividing the portrait up. along these lines. So the first thing I tried was I tried the left-hand portrait line and I covered it up, up the uh, left-hand side of the portrait, like so. As you can see, there's some subtle differences in the expression.
to me, it looks as if he's smirking. Is he laughing at some inside joke? And is that a smirk? His eye seems to be widening in anticipation of a hearty laugh. In order to make sure that this is what I was really seeing, I had to compare it to the drought out. As you can see, there is a difference between the eyes. And it's made more apparent if we whiten the eyes. Notice how they're different sizes. The martial eye is a lot larger. Do we color the martial in gold? And place it beneath the Drochout eye. You can see that there's at least a 30% difference in size, maybe 40. Clearly, Marshall widened the eye to make the expression different. Next, we'll compare their mouths. In particular, this part. right along the right hand side. Watch the right hand corner. As before, I'll superimpose the Marshall portrait over the Drogues out and increase its transparency so you get the desired effect. As you can see, Marshall narrowed the lower lip and curled the upper lip just slightly to give it that smirk. And you can also see that Marshall narrowed the cheek and jawline just a bit to make it look like he's bowing his head towards us. We can also see some other differences here. The merchant now wears a plain doublet rather than the embroidered doublet of the Drosout. Now for the other side of the portrait. This side, he definitely wears the cloak of a noble. He now holds the laurels as if he deserves them. Some claim the sprig is from the acacia. Let's see if this is true. On the right, we have the martial sprig. In the middle, we have acacia tortillas. And in the right, we have acacia peninervis. Let's compare silhouettes of the leaves. I'm coloring the marshal in red just so that we get a bit of a contrast between the two. It's definitely not this acacia, acacia tortillas. Acacia tortillas' leaves are finger-like leaves coming from the stem. It 
could be acacia pennin nervous. But there is a very big catch. It's native to Australia. And I don't believe that acacia was transplanted to Europe in the 16th or 17th centuries. So what I did was I decided to go online and check out some more plants that had some symbolic meaning, which could be related to this portrait. I came up with the hyssop, which symbolizes cleanliness, sacrifice, and repentance. Why? I don't know, but that's there. It's the closest leaf I could get to that, which the martial portrait is holding. And of course, the laurel, which is given to people for winning the Olympics, for instance, or emperors who come back from big conquests. So let's compare the silhouettes again. Definitely not the hyssop because the hyssop is much narrower leaf in proportion to its length. However, it is the laurel. In fact, Marshall has put a central ridge in the laurel leaves just to make it resemble that of the, the actual plant. So it is a laurel. And he's grabbing it as if he's saying, mine. And there's also a deep shadow on the collar, which is going to become significant in a little bit. And there's a strange glare behind his head, which should be a shadow, but it isn't. That is also going to be very interesting and important later on. On to the next step. Because this portrait is a mirror image of the Drosshout, I figured for readers of the first folio who purchased this book, that was a clue to use a mirror along the collar or portrait lines. Now we're going to add a mirror along the collar lines, beginning with the left hand side. So let's place the mirror along the left hand side to see what we get. When I flip the graphic over for this experiment, as I can do for my, with my software, what came out was absolutely startling, to say the least. Here we have a guy who's just smirking away and just kind of enjoying a little inside joke. But when we flip the image over and join the two halves together again, We get this monstrous merchant whose head is impaled on a spear. Now, now these shapes look odd. The one on the right looks kind of familiar. So I enlarged it and tried to trace out all the light spots that I see there on the engraving. That's the areas where the ink did not collect. To me, it looks like an ear. And what it suggests 
is the message is for us to listen to the portrait. Furthermore, this portrait of the merchant has monstrous eyes that are very unnerving to look at, kind of bear down at me. I'm a fan of horror films, and this was quite uncanny for me. I'm getting used to it now, but when I started looking at this and investigating this, I was completely, yeah, nerd, unnerved is to say the least of it. And look at his hands. He has snapped the laurel as if mocking the accolades, saying, somebody else doesn't deserve it or i'm going to mock the person who really deserves it so much for this monstrous merchant let's place the mirror on the right hand collar lane line and see what we get the results were fascinating not only that, but it contains more clues in the Shakespeare authorship game than I had ever expected from a portrait. This is what I call the fat cat merchant. Notice his expression is much more pleasant. We can look at it much easier. He even has a cat like nose. Go figure. He now wears a full cloak over his shoulders, meaning that he is definitely nobility. Sumptuary laws insisted that only nobles and aristocrats could wear cloaks. Commoners who did so faced harsh penalties. But notice the shapes right at the bottom of his chest. Right in the middle, we have a bee hive sign of industriousness. And now we have what my wife discovered and showed to me was an intact laurel crown. This clearly is the man who deserves the accolades. Furthermore, we have a tiny shield with the letter V. Right here in the center of the chest, below the collar, is a perfect letter O. I didn't discover this until long after I flipped the images over and I just kept looking at it and looking at it. I went away from it for a while and then I looked at it again and then bingo, this thing snapped right out. Now I figured out something else about it. Which brings me to this. What is this? This looks like another letter. Another V. doubling the V in the shield. That gives us this monogram, O, B. Remember that glare behind his head? Well, we can extend these lines downward. to get a partially hidden tongue. Sweetened with honey from the beehive. It's a perfect fit. This mirror portrait tells us a honey-tongued noble identifiable by the initials OV 
wrote the poems because he's got the intact laurel. There is more. This is stuff I discovered months after I discovered the split portraits and the more mirrored portraits. The rough looks like a protractor. You notice the straight bottom. Like so. So let's measure some angles. First of all, we can construct a triangle here with the lines from the cloak, the tip of the cloak, and the base of the ledge. It's 40, 60, and 80 degrees. The bottom of the right arm is at 40 degrees. And it crosses the center of the fourth button from the bottom, goes through the tip of the 60, 40, 60, 80 degree triangle, and crosses the tip of the left hand side of the rough. They give us three anchor points. For another example of triacent omnia. And of course, these make two triangles. When you use this as a baseline on the cloak, this angle measures at 40 degrees, or you could do it the other way around doesn't make any difference. The lower stem of the laurel is at 57 degrees, which is 17 plus 40. The angle from the point of the cloak's collar to the laurel leaf is 37 degrees, which is 20, the letter V in Latin gematria, plus 17. This seam in the middle of the right arm is at a 51 degree angle, which is 17 times 3. This seam with the shoulder wing is at a 90 degree angle, and it is a digit sub number. Add the numbers, folks. The upper right hand arm is at a 56 and a half degree angle, but it could just as well be 57. There are two anchor points at the top, the tip of the collar and the tip of the shoulder wing. Add this point and we have another example of triacent omnia. just like the 40 degree angle. The cloak's inner edge closest to the button line is at 72 degrees. If we add this angle to the right hand angle, 98, we get 170. 17 times 10. The buttons are at an 84 degree angle. And we have another trio of anchor points. We have the laurel leaf just above his gloved hand. We have the left hand corner of his mouth and right against the left nostril. What that means, I don't know. But looking at this portrait, I noticed something. 
This here looks odd. The berry seems to be placed there for some purpose. So naturally I asked myself, why? Well, I figured let's draw some lines from that point along the only conceivable markers we could find, and that is along the cheeks. And then I measured their angle. The difference seems to be 31 degrees. That's meaningful. In the Latin alphabet repeating count, 31 is HH. HH is two eighths or 88. And 88 is four T. Homophone for the number 40. So this hides the number 40, which of course is twice 20. Or double the letter V. Does this mean we have another monogram in an impossible frame or an impossible writer? There's more. There's always more. Remember this shadow? and how it's a really deep shadow and it covers pretty much the entire width of the collar. It's there for a reason, to make you see this. The row of buttons makes the handle of a mask. It becomes more obvious when we adjust the line so he is holding it more securely where his thumb would meet the palm of his hand. Once you see it, you can never unsee it. For now, we recognize The mask floats above the collar ruff. That's why the shadow is darker. There is even a heavy line for the edge of the mask. So, who is the noble OV seen in the mirror? And who is the impaled monstrous merchant snapping the laurel? The merchant is the man whose name seems to be on the title page, but really isn't. In the split portrait, he is smirking at some inside joke. In the split portrait, the, the noble holds the laurels. Mine. The laurel is intact in the mirror portrait. The noble is O V.
Hidden in this puzzle portrait are clues that the man behind the words is Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford, O. V. Thank you for watching. Stay safe, everybody.